This is Beethoven. It's the introduction to The Creatures of Prometheus, a ballet performed in Vienna in 1801. Prometheus is the Greek god who defied Zeus to give the gift of fire to man so that man could innovate, progress and become civilized. For this act of defiance, Prometheus was sentenced by Zeus to be chained to a boulder for eternity, where each day an eagle would feast on his liver, which would grow back again before the following day. First introduced by the Greek poet Hesiod in the 8th century BCE, Prometheus has been a symbol of many things. To some, he's a rebel who stole from the gods. To others, through fire, he gave humans the gift of intelligence and technology. To some, he's a trickster, to others a symbol of the secret to life. Beethoven, who clearly interpreted the Promethean myth with optimism, composed the ballet just as Napoleon was bringing the French Revolution to an end. Beethoven came to see Napoleon as a Promethean figure, a figure who had brought the secret of democratic stability to man while simultaneously protecting from the oppression of Zeus-like, all-powerful monarchism. Around 25 years before this was composed, as France became increasingly unstable, the German writer Goethe wrote a poem about Prometheus in which the god berates Zeus. Here sit I, forming mortals, after my image, a race resembling me, to suffer, to weep, to enjoy, to be glad, and thee to scorn, as I. Prometheus appears frequently in Goethe's work as a figure who is sympathetic to man's troubles and scornful of Zeus's malice in intending to create man without the comforts of fire. To Goethe, Prometheus is a god that teaches man to cope with the difficulties of the world. Then, in 1789, the people take power in France and cut off Louis XVI's head. Europe changes forever. The revolution is tumultuous until Napoleon returns France to some kind of stability. But a couple of years after Beethoven composes his Ode to Prometheus, Napoleon goes to war with the rest of Europe. The conflict lasts until 1815, when Napoleon is finally defeated and exiled on St Helena, where he dies a few years later. Europe is war-torn, politically and socially unstable. Unemployment is high. On April the 5th of 1815, some 6,500 miles away, in modern-day Indonesia, Mount Tambora erupts. It was one of the most powerful eruptions ever known. The crashing and rumbling could be heard from a thousand kilometers away. The death toll was at least 71,000 people, and the settled dust on the ground built up to over a metre high. The geologist Charles Lewell wrote that the darkness occasioned in the night time by the ashes in Java was so profound that nothing equal to it was ever witnessed in the darkest night. The blanket of dust and ash in the air was so thick, so complete, that tens of thousands choked to death. The sun disappeared, the ash spread, global temperatures dropped and weather patterns became volatile as far away as America. Thomas Jefferson wrote to a friend that we have had the most extraordinary year of drought and cold ever known in the history of America and the effect of the eruption lasted so long that it wouldn't be until the following summer that Europe would feel the full weight of its consequences. Temperatures plummeted, and it even snowed in July. In Hungary, the snow was reported to be tinged brown and orange. Crops failed, and in the wake of an already fragile continent ravaged by war, famine spread. Ireland saw the worst potato famine it had so far endured. 
It was in the midst of this turmoil, in what came to be called the Year Without a Summer, that a group of five travelled from England to a small house by a lake in Geneva. They were the poets Lord Byron and Percy Shelley, along with Byron's physician, Dr Polidori, Mary Godwin and her stepsister, Jane Claremont. Mary Godwin was the daughter of a famous English anarchist, William Godwin, still widely read today, and Mary Wollstonecraft, author of one of the earliest works of modern feminist philosophy, a vindication of the rights of women, who had died soon after Mary's birth. The rights of women was a response to the American revolutionary, Thomas Paine's The Rights of Man, as well as a rebuttal to the revolutionaries in France who were arguing and fighting for rights of men while refusing to extend their arguments to women. Their daughter Mary was 18 years old as this young group travelled to Geneva and was in the midst of a romance with Percy Shelley, five years her elder. Shelley himself would not see literary success in his lifetime and was becoming estranged from his family for his increasingly radical political views. He had already been expelled from Oxford for his atheism. Mary's stepsister, Claire, had wanted to reignite a romance with Lord Byron, who now lived in exile from England after a string of public affairs and a reputation for debauchery. When they reached the lakes of Geneva, Mary wrote that the thunderstorms that visit us are grander and more terrific than I have ever seen before. And Byron was inspired to write the poem Darkness, which includes the lines, All earth was but one thought, and that was death, immediate and inglorious, and the pang of famine fed upon all entrails. Men died, and their bones were tombless as their flesh, the meagre by the meagre were devoured. It was in this setting of rapturous weather, famine, war and revolution, counterpoised against the tenuous optimism of enlightenment science and the politics of liberty, that, confined indoors and bored, it was suggested that each traveller tells and then writes a short ghost story. Mary, young as she was, faltered at first, but over the next few nights conceived one of the most enduring stories ever written. In The Year Without a Summer, Mary, later to marry and publish under the name Mary Shelley, gave birth to Frankenstein. As the subtitle Frankenstein or the Modern Prometheus suggests, Shelley's story of a scientist who discovers the secret to creating life is a retelling of the myth that's far less optimistic than Beethoven or Goethe's interpretation. Dr Frankenstein's new scientific knowledge is a curse. He unleashes a monster that kills everyone he loves, and the monster himself is a lonely creature who is deformed and isolated through no fault of his own. Shelley sees Prometheus as a figure who is burdened with a secret, the secret of innovation and knowledge, and the limits and potential horrors of its power. For Shelley, Frankenstein is in part a response to the excesses of the French Revolution, and in part the limits of science and knowledge. Prometheus's gift of fire is symbolised as the existential angst of man's own possibilities and the fragility of human endeavours. Byron and Shelley were also taken by the Prometheus myth, both writing their own poems and dramas about the god, but they, like Beethoven and Goethe, had an optimistic take on the story. It might be said that only Mary predicted the horrors still to come for Europe, where others saw the Enlightenment as an end of history. The scientific method was only just starting to flourish, and innovation was both promising and terrifying to a society that was still emerging from the Dark Ages. Mary had been reading innovative new theories about chemistry and the human mind, like Locke's belief that the human mind was simply a blank slate, filled from experience alone. The monster slowly experiences and learns about the world, but he looks around and sees the division of property, of immense wealth and squalid poverty, of rank, descent and noble blood. Frankenstein was published anonymously at first, and even then received mixed reviews. 
When the author became known to the public, the British critic, a conservative quarterly, wrote, the writer of it is, we understand, a female. This is an aggravation of that which is the prevailing fault of the novel. But if our authoress can forget the gentleness of her sex, it is no reason why we should, and we shall therefore dismiss the novel without further comment. Frankenstein is a story written under the shadow of war and possibility, myth and poets, and the very real shadow of ash, conceived in a year without a summer, and incredibly, it was written by a 19-year-old woman, confined inside but raised and surrounded by brilliance. It is this over-determination of events at the birth of the modern era that makes Frankenstein so enduring and so representative of the modern questions about science and democracy and humanity that endure to this day. If you like these videos and would like to support me making more, you can follow me on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook by clicking the links in the description below. You can like this video and subscribe to the Then and Now channel to see more. And if you're feeling really generous, you can pledge as little as a dollar towards the creation of each new video. You can click here to find out more. Thank you.